A number of different methods for leading people to Christ have been developed over the years. Uh, I think probably the most common is popularly called the Roman Road. And it's called that simply because it takes the verses in the book of Romans and walks through them. There are other methods that have been developed. I remember many years ago there was one that was popular, I haven't heard of it lately, called uh, something like Four Things You Need to Know or something. And it basically was the Roman road, it just used different verses rather than all the verses in the book of Romans. But probably the most common method that's been used at least in my lifetime was from Campus Crusade for Christ. They produced a little booklet and then started with uh, the four spiritual laws and it was used on university and college campuses all over the country and even beyond our borders. And then there was another program that didn't, that wasn't as known, well known popularly but probably had a similar kind of effect. It was developed by a pastor in Florida named Kennedy. It was a Presbyterian. And it was called Evangelism Explosion. And so, to my knowledge, in my lifetime, those are the types of methods, uh, some of the most well-known types of methods of leading people to Christ. And of course, there are many others. Billy Graham used to have something called the Steps to Peace with God. And on and on you could go. Being interested in this subject, being involved in evangelism even, I've often wondered, how did Peter do it? How did Paul do it? I've often thought, boy, wouldn't it have been interesting if you could have followed Paul around and watched him lead somebody to Christ? Would that have been fun or what? Or Peter or any of the other of the apostles, Matthew, or any of the others. Well, I'm not sure we can piece together exactly how they did it, but one day it occurred to me, wait a minute, there is somebody in the Bible who is called an evangelist. Only one. And we are given enough detail uh, to know how he led somebody to Christ. We are given an example of how Philip the evangelist led somebody to Christ. And I thought, wow, maybe that's what we need to look at to see how to do this. So that's what I'd like for us to do tonight. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. I'm going to show you the illustration or example of Philip leading somebody to the Lord. And I want to extract from this the principles of a gospel presentation. So I want to look at principles that we can apply as we do this in our own case. So let's begin with Acts chapter 8 and look at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, of uh, a, 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 eunuch, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who had charged of all of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. And returning in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and take, overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guide me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. 
In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and he will declare, who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began in the same scripture and preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that he saw the eunuch no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Astrus, and passing through, he preached in the cities until he came to Caesarea. All right. This is a rather simple story. Uh, Philip is in Samaria. He's preaching, and we would say he was having a city-wide evangelistic crusade, and people were coming to Christ all over the place. And all of a sudden, we're told in verse 26, the angel of the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to leave this city impacting ministry that you have and I want you to go down to the desert. So, verse 27, he arose and he went and behold, as he's traveling, he sees an Ethiopian, a eunuch of great authority from Ethiopia and he's in a chariot. Now this is basically all the information we have about this fella and other than the fact that he had just come from Jerusalem but based on this verse we can piece together some things about him. For example uh, he was a eunuch of great authority. He had authority in charge of the treasury so he was the secretary of finance in Ethiopia. Furthermore, he was in a chariot, which alone would indicate that he was a person of position and power. That might be like us saying today that you saw this fella and he was sitting in a limousine in the back seat. Uh, that alone indicates that he was a man of power and position. At any rate, at this case, the Bible tells us, verse 28, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip says to him, you understand what you're reading? Does that strike you as rather blunt? I mean, coming upon a total stranger who's reading a scroll and saying to him, hey, do you understand what you're reading? that kind of odd? And the answer is no. Let me explain. You see, the manuscript that he was reading was written in all capital letters. There were no spaces between the words and no punctuation. Uh, when I'm in class teaching this and I have a board behind me, I write, God so loved the world uh, on the board with no spaces between the letters and no punctuation. Could you read that? Well, you would have to go through it rather slowly. Now, in that case, you know the verse, but um, you would probably have to go through it a little slowly to make out what it said. And so what they did is they read out loud. As a matter of fact, the way this is written in the Greek text, it's an indication that he was reading out loud. So, it wasn't as odd as it strikes us. The tone of his voice, perhaps, indicated he was struggling to read it and understand it. At any rate, be all that as it may, here's what I want you to notice. Verse 30. 
So, Peter ran to him, heard him reading, heard him reading, reading out loud, the prophet Isaiah, and said, do you understand what you're reading? So what's the principle? What's the point for us? In this case, Philip began an evangelistic conversation by asking a question. That's principle number one. How do you start? Answer, you ask a question. Now put your finger in Acts 8. I'm going to come back there in a second and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And look at this well-known verse again. 1 Peter 3. 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense of, to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give a defense, an answer to anyone who asks you a question. Now the context of this verse is that Peter is talking about suffering for righteousness' sake. And the point is that if you are suffering for the Lord, for righteousness' sake, and handling it well, somebody's going to say to you, how do you do that? And so Peter is saying, be ready to be able to give an answer for that hope that is in you that allows you to undergo this kind of suffering. My point is this, in Acts 8, Peter, I'm sorry, Philip provided a question. In 1 Peter 3, Peter is talking about provoking a question. But in both cases, whether you supply the question or the unbeliever supplies the question, in both cases, the conversation commences with a question. I am told that the two most difficult parts of flying an airplane is taking off and landing. I have had pilots take me up in a small plane, and once we were airborne, I had one fellow say, here, take the controls, fly it. I said, you have got to be kidding. He said, no, take it. And I could fly it once it had taken off. I didn't have to take off, and I didn't have to land. But up there, there was nothing to it. So it seems to me that's the problem in evangelism. The two most difficult points is taking off and landing. And the most difficult of the two is taking off. How do you get to the point where you can talk about the gospel? Here is the answer. You ask a question. A question is the line of demarcation in a conversation where you launch into a spiritual presentation of the gospel. It's like flying across the Atlantic. There is a point at which if you develop trouble, it is easier to keep going than to turn around. It's a shorter distance to go on than to try to get back to the base. That's what happens in a conversation. You can talk all around spiritual things, but once you ask that question, you've passed the line of demarcation, and it's just easier to go on than to turn around and go back. Unless, of course, the plane crashes. And in some cases, you pass that point in a spiritual conversation, and it's obvious that it's not going to go anywhere, and the plane crashes. But the point I'm trying to make is, that's the line you cross. This has been one of the most helpful suggestions I have ever had or ever given in telling people how to lead people to Christ. Just ask a question. Years ago, I decided to collect uh, ways to lead people to Christ. As you know, I was in evangelism. I taught evangelism. And I was 
very interested in this subject and I wanted to see all the different ways to do it. So I, I collected a pile of booklets and all kinds of other things. So one day I took them all out, spread them out on my desk and said, now what can I learn from this? In that case, very informal kind of survey. In that little experiment, every one of them, without exception, began with a question. Sort of slapped me in the face. I mentioned earlier Campus Crusade for Christ. Their question was, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? Now that is about as non-threatening a question as you could possibly ask. Because most college students would look at you and say, what are you talking about? What laws? Laws about what? Well, I got this little booklet here and I can show you the four spiritual laws. And bam, you're in the middle of a gospel. That's one illustration. James Kennedy, that pastor I mentioned in Florida, who's now with the Lord, uh, created a system and he had two questions. Uh, one was... Are you in the place of, in your spiritual journey where you know for sure you're going to heaven? And then he used a question. I thought he originated, and I discovered later it existed before he used it. And it's one of my favorites. Uh, I call it the diagnostic question. This gets at the heart of the issue better than anything I know. And his, his second question was this. If you stood before God and God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Are you writing these questions down? I got a pocket full of them. I don't use the same one every time. I just got to get to the conversation and it depends on who I'm talking to and the circumstances and how much rapport I have with them. But I love that second question. I usually don't use it first, uh, but if somebody tells me they, they're gonna go to heaven, that's the question I ask them for sure. And I did it Sunday. Uh, matter of fact, the fellow I led to the Lord uh, within the last six months and hadn't seen him for a while. And he was in church Sunday and, and I just wanted to check him out. So uh, I, I, that was the question I asked him. And he gave me the right answer, which I was very pleased to hear. But the point is, you got to have a question. So write them down. Get a question. Uh, there was another extremely evangelistic pastor named Jack Hiles. He was an independent Baptist pastor in Hammond, Indiana. He too is now with the Lord. And his question was, if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And what I always thought was kind of interesting about that is that <clears throat> James Kennedy was a Presbyterian. And he dealt with probably upper middle class people. And Jack Hiles worked with working class people. And they both asked the same question. It's just that Jack Hiles was a little more frontal with it, uh, Kennedy would say, <clears throat> have you come to the place in your spiritual journey? A very diplomatic way to put it. Hiles just would say, if you died today, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. But it's both the same question, dealing with assurance. Or there's any other number of questions you could use. So, Campus Crusade, work on college campus. Kennedy, Presbyterian. Uh, in order, by the way, for, for people in his church to witness to you, you had to visit his church. They visited visitors in their home. That was his way. And they got a probably an upper middle class kind of clientele in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Jack Hiles is working with the working class, but they're all starting with a question. Throughout the, the structure, the class structure, they're all asking a question. I can't emphasize enough that's the way you get started. Now your response to that's going to probably be, well, isn't that kind of blunt? I mean, if you get too confrontational, aren't you going to offend people? Well, I've seen that happen. Uh, I've done it for decades, and I can't remember the last time I offended somebody. I think it's as much the way you do it as what you do. And I establish rapport. I talked about that last time. Get to know the person a little bit and try to make it as natural a transition as possible, but you still gotta ask the question. 
And if you're genuinely concerned about it, not just trying to notch your gun belt with converts, uh, that comes through, and I think that saves the day. I heard of a lady once who was shopping in a mall with her husband, and they'd gotten separated, and they were going to meet at some place, and when she was waiting for him to come back, some Christian gave her a track and was talking to her about the Lord when her husband came back. And she and her husband left, and as they walked off, the husband said to her, what did he want? And she said he wanted to know if I, was going to, if I knew for sure I was going to heaven. And her husband said, well, that's none of his business. And she said, funny, but if you'd have seen the expression on his face, you would have thought it was. Yeah, it is my business. And if you're gentle and diplomatic, what did I say last time? Wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. You can get it done. But whether you ask a diplomatic question, I mean, the most non-threatening question I've ever used is, have you ever thought much about spiritual things? Now, that's not very threatening, you know? And then if they say no, are, they, are you interested in spiritual things? Now, next time, I'm going to tell you in great detail how I personally lead somebody to Christ. And I'm going to go through exactly what I do step by step. I'm going to show you the questions I ask, the order in which I ask them, and the presentation I make. For tonight, I just want to make the point that the principle is ask a question. The way to commence the conversation is to ask a question. Caprice? Have I made that clear? You got that? You got three questions you can ask? Yeah. All right. What did he do next? Well, in this case, the eunuch said, how, how, how can I understand, verse 31, unless someone guide me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him, and the place in the scripture which he read was this. Ah, stop. Principle number two. To communicate, use the scripture. That is incredibly simple. But use the scripture. That is very, very, very important. For one thing, the scripture is sharper than any two-edged sword. It does the work of dissecting the thoughts and intents of the heart like nothing we could do or say or any other instrument we could use. It's imperative that you use the scripture. But I think another reason for insisting on using the scripture is this. There's something about this subject that gives the people the impression that we think we're better than they are. And I think that's rooted in the idea that they think in the first place that you got to be good to get to heaven. So if we're going to talk about going to heaven, they automatically assume, well, then you think you're good. And you automatically think I'm bad, especially if you start out telling them they're sinners. So I think that using the scripture alleviates some of that. I'm going to give you some suggestions next time on how I try to alleviate that problem. But it's a problem. So by saying, let me show you what the Bible says, it's not me telling you what you need to do, it's the Bible. So blame it on the Bible. In other words, I'm a mailman. I'm just delivering the mail. That's all I am. I'm, so here is the message. Now, the passage tells us, in verse 32, the place in the scripture which he read was this. And that word seems to indicate not just the verses that are recorded here in verses 32 and verse 33, both of which come out of Isaiah. But the fact that he uses the place seems to indicate 
that he was talking about the whole portion of Isaiah chapter 53. At any rate, they looked at the passage. In verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other person? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this scripture, preach to him Jesus. So, I know this is incredibly simple, but it needs to be said. If you're going to lead people to Christ, use the Bible and talk about Christ. Now, I know that the eunuch was reading this passage, but the Spirit of God put this in here for our instruction telling us that what we should do is go to a passage of Scripture that's talking about Christ. Stay out of Genesis 1. Go to Isaiah 53. This is not about creation. It is about Christ. There is no other name given among heaven, under heaven, by which a person gets saved, but by the name of Jesus Christ. They've got to know about the Lord. Now, having said that, let me say, that they don't have to know everything about the Lord. If you do that, you're going to cover all four Gospels, and you don't have that kind of time. So I think it's incredibly interesting that this passage focuses on the death of Jesus Christ. Go back to verse 32. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And he who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Clearly, this passage in Isaiah 53 and other verses in Isaiah 53 as well are talking about the death of Jesus Christ. He went to his death submissively as a sheep to his slaughter. He went silently. He opened not his mouth. He went in unjustly. He shouldn't have been condemned. At any rate, who's going to declare this? That his life was taken from the earth. And as Isaiah 53 makes clear, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, if you've been following me in this series on evangelism, you know that I've made an issue out of the fact that the gospel is lock the door. You can't leave until you give me the right answer to that question. Do you know what the gospel is? And do you know where the passage is that defines the gospel? Ooh, it's 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the gospel is Christ died for our sins and arose from the dead. Now, when you are going to lead somebody to Christ, whatever else you do, tell them Jesus died and that pays for their sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says Christ died for our sins. Amen. Now, I've talked to people for years, as you know, and I've listened to people talk about the gospel and preachers preach about the gospel and read presentations of the gospel. I think I even told you the first time somebody taught me how to lead somebody to Christ, they gave me a booklet and it had everything in it but the gospel. I'm amazed at how preachers and evangelists leave out the gospel. They'll talk about Christ, they talk about heaven, they talk about forgiveness, they talk about all kinds of things. They don't explain that Jesus Christ died in your place to pay for your sin. That's the message you have got to give them. So, give them the gospel. Paul said, I saved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Romans 1.16. So give them the gospel. Use the scripture to preach Christ and the cross. Basically, that Christ died 
for our sins. So, principle number one is to commence, ask a question. Principle number two is to communicate, use the scripture about Christ and his crucifixion. Principle number three, how do you land the plane? How do you close? Well, keep reading. Verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said to him, if you believe in all your heart, you may. And he answered and said to him, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. What's the principle? Did you get it? You stress that you've got to trust Christ. Verse 37, if you believe. So end by simply telling the person that what they have to do is believe. They have to trust Jesus Christ. Now you've heard me talk about the fact that the Bible uses uh, believe in meaning to trust, that you're trusting in Christ. Now that's really significant in this passage because more than likely the eunuch was a Gentile, not a Jew. And he was a eunuch. Uh, Both of those things would have excluded him from the house of Israel. So the great, glorious good news for him is all you have to do is have faith. And that's the great good news for us today. That all you have to do is trust Christ. Now, I want to get very, 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 very technical for just a second. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I use the New King James translation of the Bible. I'm very partial to that. And the reason is, I think it's the best translation I've seen of the right Greek text. There, This is a very complicated subject. I've lectured on it, but... <clears throat> in other times and other places. But there is a traditional text and a new critical text. I was taught the critical text in seminary, and after I got out, I ran across some books that converted me to the idea that the traditional text is a more accurate text. The only two translations that are well known that are based on that traditional text are the King James Version and the New King James Version. In my opinion, the New King James Version is nothing more than a King James that took out the these and the dows and straightened out a couple of translations that should be uh, straightened out. However, there are two passages of Scripture that probably should not be in the King James Version or the New King James Version because they're not in the majority of Greek manuscripts, the traditional text. And one of them is verse 37. And the other is in 1 John chapter 5 that deals with the Trinity. But be that as it may, there is no question but that the New Testament stresses that what you have to do is believe. Matter of fact, all you have to do to figure that out is just keep reading the book of Acts. So you get to Acts chapter 10 and Peter is preaching in Cornelius' house and Verse 43, it says, Peter's preaching, we're breaking in on the middle of his sermon. To him, all the prophets witnessed that through his name, whosoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. And you keep reading and you get to 16, chapter 16. And Paul tells the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So there's simply no question but that the way you should end is by stressing the fact that what you need to do is trust Jesus Christ. Now, I've talked about this in this series. It's not ask Jesus into your heart. It's not give your life to Christ. It's not, I don't, it's accept Christ. That's a very popular term. None of those are in the scripture. 
What's in the scripture over and over and over and over again is believe, believe, believe. Believe on, believe in, indicating this is a belief that's trust, that you're trusting Jesus Christ for the gift of eternal life. That's 1 Timothy 1.16. Remember the night we talked about that? Or, the way I like to say it, you trust Christ to get you to heaven. That's the issue. I've asked people, are you saved? That's a very bad question, by the way. And I've had them tell me, yes, I was once drowning and somebody threw me a life jacket. No, 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 no. I'm talking about being saved going to heaven. Now, what's that? So I read, that's the reason I like to say it like this. Trust Christ to get you to heaven. That's the way you end this conversation. Now, I've said several times, next time, I'm going to take these principles and show you how I apply them. I'm going to show you in great detail how I go through them. And... I'll give even more information on how I close the conversation. For now, for today, what I want to emphasize are the principles. And the reason I want to do that is this. When I originally taught a course on evangelism, I just taught the principles. I was teaching in a seminary class, and I didn't want them to just do what I did because I did it. I just wanted them to follow the principles. It's the principles that are given to us in the scripture. But they wouldn't let me get away with that because then they wonder, well, how do you do it? So I'll do both. But I think it's important that we establish the principles. So whether or not you follow my method is immaterial. What's important is that you follow the principles. I think the one illustration, the one and only illustration, we are given in the New Testament of an evangelist leading somebody to Christ is he starts with a question he proceeds by using the scripture to present the death of Christ and he closes with faith those are the three principles now I can just imagine the objection so I want to close by telling you you can do this and I want to use three people as an illustration. The first person I want to use as an illustration is Philip. <clears throat> Your objection is going to be, well, Philip was an evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. I understand that. But let me just tell you, Philip is not called an evangelist in this passage of Scripture. Philip is not called an evangelist until you get to chapter 21. So let me show you what Philip did that you can do. You ready for this? We've got to go back through this passage. <clears throat> Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 27. Verse 27 says, So he arose and went. That's what he did. He got off his dirt and he went. He went. Can you go? That's what he did. Drop down to verse 30. So Philip ran to him, heard he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, and said, Can you speak? That's what he did. He went and he said. Look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. Can you open your mouth? And let words come out? That's what Philip did. Look at verse 37. Then Philip said, If you can talk, you can do what Philip did. So don't use Philip being an evangelist as an excuse. Let me use a second illustration. I think a great illustration for all of us in this area is Moses. Oh, I could never be Moses. Confront Pharaoh? Are you kidding me? Part the Red Sea? Lead two million people out of Egypt into the promised land? Oh, I could never. 
I could never be a Moses. Well, let me tell you what Moses said. God said to Moses, I want you, the meekest man in the earth, to go to Pharaoh. And you know what Moses said to him? Me? I can't speak. Remember that? So that's not going to help you, your case, if you're trying to look for an excuse. If you can't speak, you're a candidate. Learn to open your mouth. The third illustration I want to use is the Apostle Paul. Now you're going to say, man, if there's anybody in the Bible I could never be, it's Paul. Do you know what the Bible says about Paul? It's not very complimentary. He wasn't much to look at or to listen to. Let me tell you what Paul said about Paul. I'm weak. Do you think of yourself as weak? Then you can be Paul. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, When I am weak, then is when I am strong. What the Lord is looking for is somebody who realizes their weakness so he can be their strength. All you have to do is open your mouth to ask a question, present the death of Christ from the scripture, and ask people to trust Christ. Let's pray.